Let's look at another example of parametrization of curves or writing the vector form for a curve. This particular example will play a more significant role um, a little bit later in the chapter with one of our key theorems in multivariable calculus. So I've got a graph grid set up and then I'll put the title of what I'm doing here in just a moment. Um, so let's suppose I were to draw you a picture that looks like this, a graph. In Calculus 1 and before, we would say a few things about this without going into a lot of detail. We could name the domain a range. We would identify that it doesn't appear to be a function, um, um, of, at least not a function of x. And we would say it looks like here it is not differentiable because there, uh, there looks like there is what we called um, a sharp turn. Well, when writing the vector or parametric forms, we have something that we call piecewise smooth curves. In other words, we'll use more than one function to describe the graph and each function will be smooth. Each piece will be smooth. So this particular graph um, is combined of the following. We're going from the origin to the point 1, 1 on the graph of y equals x cubed. So from here to here on the graph of y equals x cubed. It's a concave up in this section. And then we're going to return to the point 0, 0 on the graph of y equals square root of x. So that would be the upper portion of the graph. Now, these don't have a symmetry because the, the, you know, the symmetric version of square root would have been x squared, or the symmetric version of x cubed would have been cubed root. Um, but that's not related to what we're studying. I just like math a lot, so I wanted to say it. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna write um, two curves. Um, we're gonna call them R1 of t and R2 of t to name the two position functions or the two vector functions. One for the first piece, one for the second piece. All right. Now, the first piece is pretty straightforward. It's pretty straightforward. And that is if x is t, then y equals t cubed, a standard function substitution. If this is x, then this is y. And our time interval would be from time 0 to time equals 1. This would represent from 0, 0 to the point 1, 1 on this portion of the curve. Now, we could use that same function concept for the return trip. But there's two obstacles to cross. And so uh, let me uh, just do the first obstacle is really small. And then for the second obstacle, I'm going to switch pages because it's more interesting. So we start at the point at the point 1 comma 1. So I need my x coordinate to start at 1. And then the delta x is actually equal to negative 1 because it goes left one unit. So it starts at 1. It goes back to 0. It's going left one unit minus 1t. And then according to what we've been doing, I could just say that y is the square root of that. 1 minus t would go here. And then there might be a little bit of a question mark about the time interval. 
I mean, if we start at t is 0, 1 minus 0 is 1. That is the x value. And if t is 0 here, I get the square root of 1. There's the y value. What do you suppose the time is for returning to the origin? How long did it take to go from here to there? Well, it only takes one second or one unit of time because 1 minus 1 would be back to 0 again. And the square root of 0 is still 0. And it turns out this is going to be our desired pair of um, functions for doing this piecewise smooth transition. So in terms of the answer, I'm done. We're going to be able to carry this forward into future parts of the chapter. Having said that, I want to show you um, an interesting little thing that I skipped over. Um, I didn't make it even look like it was possible. How is it possible for at time zero you to be at the origin, but then at time zero you're at this point? How could you possibly be at two places at the same time? And it turns out that that's sort of a little interesting side effect of this, and it's worth looking at. But when the dust settles, it will turn out that it doesn't impact us to actually look at this as maybe um, in a computer world, dual processors. So one processor is calculating this and another processor. So you don't have one thing at the same two places at the same time. You have two things, two different places. And so allow me to show you what that looks like, this little sort of uh, discussion. And then I have sort of a way of looking at it that is not typical for a calculus book. And that's why I like it, because you can read the calculus book. I want you to have alternative sources. I would definitely be alternative. Here we go. So we're looking at this in particular, the second curve which a moment ago I said we could use this as our function. And we're going to use this as our function. This is still what we're going to end up with. But I want to show you how to write it so we can write it so that R2, our second curve, actually goes and doesn't start until time one. You have the first piece going here in one second, and then the second piece begins at time one. And so what I'm gonna do right now is, um, you know, I don't think I'll name it yet. I'm just gonna let you watch the math here take place. I wanna take you on um, a little time travel, since I know it's not possible to do this, but a little trip down memory lane. And, um, Remind you, if we had this parabola, which looks something like this, and we had this parabola, what happens to the vertex of this parabola? Where does this vertex move to? That's right. That is correct. One unit to the right. This is how we shifted a function, shift to the right by one unit. Well, I can do that here. I can write this so it shifted one time unit over in a positive direction. I'll call it moving time to the right. Where t was, I'm going to replace it with t minus 1. Where x was, we replaced it by x minus 1. This is going to shift it one time unit to the right. And therefore, the y value is the square root of that. If t is 1, this is 0. 1 minus 0 is 1. I start at the point 1. 
well, 1, 1, that'd be square root of 1. What's the time value where it all ends? Well, if it took one second to get there and we shifted the graph by one unit in the sense of time, I claim it'll be 2. 2 minus 1 is 1. 1 minus that 1 equals 0. Puts me here. Square root of 0 is 0. Puts me there. The textbook will probably use the book will probably use this version here. Yet I've already established I am very comfortable with using this one here. Now, this isn't a full explanation, nor is it a full derivation, but it's a concept comparison. It's a concept comparison. Back to the parabolas. Now for the Calc 1 students. If I were to go from 0 to 1 and calculate this area, I would say it's the definite integral from 0 to 1 of x squared with respect to x. That would be the area. And for this problem, that same exact area equals equals from 1 to 2 x minus 1 squared dx. It turns out we're going to use these functions in definite integral expressions and shifting it to the right is not necessary to do the calculation. Now that's not a proof of what we're going to do in the future. This is just me showing you a comparison of something that we sort of trusted in before. And I'm saying if you slide this over one unit t, it's no different from this one. These will generate the same exact picture, but this, uh, this one up here has fewer terms. It is much simpler to look at. So keep this all in mind as we move into a really important topic called the line integral coming soon.